So good morning. Uh, yep, yeah, we'll be talking about Vivid. Uh, Vivid is what is it? Um, it's uh, a way of doing sound synthesis and processing in Haskell using Super Collider uh, as a rendering engine. Um, Super Collider is a uh, 20 odd year old program at this point, written in C++, very powerful. Um, and so we use Haskell for the higher level musical structures and um, it bottoms out in basically C++. Um, goals for Vivid are that it's ergonomic, that it's easy to use, that things are succinct. Um, the other sort of contrasting goal though is it really should be sort of concrete. Uh, so it's like the foundation of a house. Um, it's somewhat bland, um, it's sturdy, uh, and it really assumes any form that you try to uh, give it. Um, so this talk is going to be a really small sort of central core of Vivid. Uh, Vivid's quite large, I've been working on it for a few years now. Um, Super Collider is large, so therefore Vivid is large. I'm going to go through design goals and implementation success and failure. Um, so first of all, I mentioned we bottom out a bunch of support plus and ICFP. Um, why is why is it flatter at all? Um, so the snarky answer to that uh, is uh, GC pluses. Right? This is thread scope. Uh, you can't really get around if you want to use Haskell. You can't really get around the fact that if you're trying to deliver 96,000 samples per second, uh, you may pause too long. You may glitch. Um, the real non-snarky answer, though, is Flutter has an amazing community, um, just really great people, friendly, willing to help, and uh, really good developers, too. Trying to get that as well. Um, it's really well designed. Um, it's batteries included, so people have spent a lot of time writing optimized and really good sounding um, unit generators, which are really the core uh, atomic complexity of uh, sound synthesis, um, and they're optimized, uh, so like they're written in a way um, that I think you'd have a really hard time um, reproducing in other ways. So for example, uh, you don't use malloc at all in unit generators. Uh, you like unroll loops, so you don't have any for loops, instead it's all like macros. Um, it, the goal is to be really, really fast. Uh, in real time. The other reason uh, why it's Collider is it's over the years essentially become the core sort of language that everybody uses. Um, informally, I was at a conference for live coding recently, and people were using a lot of different languages and systems, but 95% were bottoming out in, in Collider. Um, so the title cycle, sound of pi, overtone, whatever's being blocked by the taskbar. <laughs> um, uh, there's a bunch of them, um, and they're all, this is sort of the common language. and. You can, and we do, uh, perform where several people will um, uh, connect to one super collider server and all perform together. Uh, we were talking earlier about um, multiple person improvisation, and that's a way to do that. Um, but just a side note, it is a spec. There are already two implementations. Nothing would stop somebody from implementing a new spec compliant with the server. I'm just reading, reading the rest a little bit there. Um, so, um, here's an example of a basics. Um, uh, the very core of Splider is making sound. You do it with a unit generator graph. So a unit generator, here we've got some simple examples. Uh, a sine oscillator um, being passed into a multiplication, which is getting sent to the out bus, which is basically the speakers. Um, so it's a directed example graph. Um, and so our first primary goal in Vivid is to represent that. Um, I want to say thanks to Rohan Drake for these uh, nice diagrams. Um, so a simple one. So we have a sine wave uh, that's getting multiplied going out to the speaker. We represent that in Vivid uh, with 0 0.1 times. We use, it's not a num, so we use a little tilde as a uh, sort of looks like a sound wave. That's the mnemonic for it. And then we've got all the math operators with the normal fixity. Uh, or sorry, um, yeah, uh, precedence. Um, and then you have a sine wave with a frequency argument of 440. Um, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time with this talk going through this unit generator um, uh, notation here. Um, so sine oscill ultimately is a bit of like a binary little executable that's coordinated by the supercomputer server. 
Um, so play, I'm going to very briefly, uh, the leftmost thing here is play. This is the only thing we're going to talk about, some practical things here. Uh, we, we keep a list of um, IP supplies and we pull from there. Uh, we compile this into a synth definition, which is like a binary format representing the graph. Uh, we construct an open sound control message and we send it over to TCP or UDP in order to actually make some sound. Um, so uh, let's look at a type. Um, Cyanos has a type here uh, which may look a little unusual. Um, so we use type family here um, to get a few properties. Um, the way that you sort of informally read this is Cyanos takes one thing, you notice it's a tuple, um, and that thing has the property that it has one required argument, which is frequency, and one optional argument, which has a default, which is face in this case. Um, and so uh, we, this is a valid um, one here, where you supply just the frequency. This is also valid frequency and phase. Order doesn't matter. Not valid, though, would be just phase without supplying the frequency. Um, the goal is to have a succinct, because we're live coding here, um, something that's morally equivalent to an HLS. Um, but you could see why, when you're on stage, you might want to be typing the former rather than the latter. Um, but these are really, the goal is for how to do the same. Um, I'll note, because I'm talking about six hundred and three failures here, HNIL is sort of a, a thorn in my side that I keep um, trying to get working better, but it's a little inelegant at the moment. Um, for time, I'm going to skip here, but basically we're doing set operations on um, uh, type level lists of strings, basically to make sure that we've got the arguments that we care about. Um, so you might be wondering from uh, the earlier slide, the fact that this function satisfies this type, doesn't that imply that we've got like a correspondence here between all of these functions and types? Um, so we've got some huge file like this, uh, where UA is unit, uh, unit generator argument. Um, and the answer is yes, we do. <laughs> we have a large file. And so, but the goal is uh, we have to, I sort of like stuff that inelegant thing into one module and you import it and it's done. Um, so you shouldn't have to interact directly. So here's why, uh, relatively quickly, why do we do that? Um, so I'm just going to go through a few things that might come to mind which don't work. Uh, you can't do a, any sort of sum type uh, on arguments um, because it's an open set of arguments. Uh, there, sure. So can we try open the doors a little bit? The air is getting really bad. Uh, sure, yeah. If somebody wants to try to do this one. Um, so it's an open, there's an open set of arguments here. So um, we, for that reason, we can't do a sum type. Um, and it, not only is it theoretically an open set, but it's actually really encouraged that people contribute their own unit generators. It's a pretty thriving community, and so the goal is if somebody wants to hack in C++ or Rust or whatever, an individual unit generator, and then write a vivid wrapper for that uh, thing, it would be trivial to do. Um, can't use records, at least until overloaded record fields. Um, and overloaded record fields way off when uh, I originally uh, was writing Vivid. Um, also because of another problem that we'll see in a little bit. Um, and another downside is like all the extensions that you have to turn on. Um, I'm very allergic to anything which introduce, introduces extra typing for a live coder. Um, which I'll talk also more about in a little bit. Um, like typing, you mean, you mean? Physical typing, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm very much of the other kind of typing. But, like, letters, yeah, not too. Um, record variance was discussed so I'll, at, at one point on some mailing list, so I'll mention it, but there's a few reasons we can't do that. One is, uh, the big one is you shouldn't really have record variance in general because you can blow things up. Um, and the second thing is, this is also closed set, so it's sort of the worst of both worlds. Um, so I, I guarantee at least a few people in the audience are really like just like itching about the underscore of the argument there. Um, because in Haskell, underscore is very idiomatically like, discarding the results of an operation. Uh, I agree with you that it's inelegant, um, but we need some way to um, disambiguate. Uh, there's a huge number of human generated arguments in a standard library, uh, some of which have names like S 
<laughs> A or Freak or, uh, or Min and Max and things like that. So we really don't want to clutter the namespace. So we need some way to disambiguate. And the Haskell report really doesn't give a lot of options. We've got uh, letters, digits, underscores, and single quotes. So we could do something like this with a double quote or something like that. But um, <coughs> underscores are what I, what I went for. Um, another question, and oh yeah. Oh, cool, thanks. Um, so why use frequency at all? Like why name the arguments? Um, there's two reasons. One, default values. The other is float line. Line is, is what I'm calling it. You've got some arguments that you don't really remember when you go back and read the code. What does it do? So I'm making an analogy here to like uh, Boolean blindness, uh, which I thought was a, from Bob Parker. It might be earlier. Um, but you know, uh, <coughs> sometimes you really want to know uh, what the arguments actually signify, not just what the types are. Um, so, um, I'm making the analogy here to floats, uh, <laughs> which can lead to actual methods. Um, so, and another nice thing is, uh, you can, by getting the typo of the UGEM, you can actually uh, see all of its arguments. Um, constraints of live coding, I'm going to talk very briefly. Uh, typing characters is really painful when you're on stage. You want it to be as short as possible. So, um, anytime we can minimize that, that's great. The name of Vivid even is partly because there's only three unique characters, it's really fast to type. Uh, like we really want to optimize this. Um, and we want to optimize it so much um, that we made a patch, which is in GHC 8.2, which allows numeric defaulting in more cases than we had before, specifically in multi-parameter type classes, which we need. Um, so we were like really, really pushing on this succinctness thing. Um, uh, oh, uh, <clears throat> I should probably be playing some audio. Um, uh, so the simplest one here uh, is the sign off that we were playing before. Um, uh, since that body is a little more complicated, um, uh, here we've got, um, uh, I will just play it instead. Um, so this is like a little more complex, um, but it's basically sort of the same, the same idea. Um, and why, you might notice there's like do notation there, why is that? Um, because not all unit generators are deterministic, so we actually do need to keep track of which are which. If you subtract white noise from white noise, it really matters whether it's the same white noise or not, either you have silence or noise. Um, so we can't, it, it needs to be in a state moment basically for our purposes. Uh, i cutting it short a little bit. Um, so, um, <laughs> okay, the one, the one last thing I'm going to get into is the synth definition. Um, so we've got, if we look at this as sort of an analogy for functions, we've got constants and we've got expressions with unit generators and numbers. Um, but we also may want variables. So in SuperCollider, you've got this notion of a frequency argument. Um, and it's an open set of things which must eventually be addressable by strings on the Flutter server. We know where this is going. We use type level strings. Um, we basically got a shorter version of data.proxy. Um, you can use with type applications a shorter syntax. Um, so here's an example of a synth definition. If you squint, it's sort of a function. You have like a lambda. You have an argument, except it has a default value. And then you're able to use that argument um, as long as the, uh, the string is in the set of all uh, strings from the synth definition. And then this is basically the, the thing that we saw before. Um, and then synth and set plays the synth definition and then changes the arguments while they're running. Um, I'm going to really quickly um, show the last example, which is a polyrhythm here um, where we have a fork, which uh, spawns something separately, uh, and we have a uh, wait, which is like a primitive timing command. Um, and so if we do, uh, oops. So that's a really simple example. Um, but so we've got timing, we've got a, a type class for this. So we have, uh, there's a lot more here, but basically node allocation, waiting, forking, uh, getting time, defining things, calling open sound control. Um, and what this gets us um, is different instances. So by default, we just play directly. When it, when it says wait, it like does a thread delay. When it says fork, it does a uh, uh, like a uh, green thread fork. Um, 
example, we may want instead to, for example, Super Collider allows sample, ac sample level accuracy of timing. So uh, we can, uh, this right now, uh, if we just call this, it's um, uh, in I.O. If we want to just say, do scheduled in, let's say, 0 0.1 seconds, this will specify every action at a precise sample level time and send it to the server. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, it normally does. Um, let's see. Um, I may have forked something by doing like that accidental line there. Um, well, You'll just have to believe me. The other, because uh, I don't want to run over, uh, the other thing that you can do is non-real-time synthesis, and that is also as simple as just write NRT, and you pass the exact same uh, thing to it, and it will just write it as a wave file. Um, and so this is like totally transparent. It behaves all the same way. Um, and I had a quick law, which I, about um, writing things, which I can really quickly go into. Um, so I dreamed this type class up in like an afternoon, and I wrote it here so it's easy, and so I want to um, sort of propose a law. Uh, all languages have strengths and weaknesses. A good language makes the strengths easy to write. In a good language, easy things are fast to write, and you have the most fun working with the language's strengths. Therefore, a disproportionate amount of your time spent using a good language is spent doing the things it's least fun to do. Um, so uh, anyway, that's uh, vivid. I, uh, I encourage questions now or during the break. We have time for one question. <laughs> one second in the last one. Anyone? Yes. If nobody else has a question, it's like cycling, right? You spend a long time going up the hill and doing a long time going down. Right. <laughs> <laughs>